on April 20th, Ben and Jerry's will introduce the burrito. And you'll see why 420 will be exactly like 420. After two childhood friends failed to achieve their biggest dreams, they decided to work for themselves. With just $5, they learned how to make ice cream and opened a shop called Ben & Jerry's in an old rundown gas station. They nearly fell into bankruptcy and got sucked into a David and Goliath battle with Pillsbury, a billion dollar corporation. But they won the public support and turned their shop into an empire that was bought for millions of dollars. The ice cream business, you know, on the outside, it's it's fun, it's uh, it's ice cream, you know, everybody loves ice cream, it's sweet, it's kids, it's uh, happiness. It, the reality of the, of the business side of ice cream is it's one of the dirtiest businesses there is. From nerds to failures, 12 years before Ben and Jerry's opened. In 1951, Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield were born in Brooklyn and raised in Long Island. They met in the seventh grade in gym class where we were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. <laughs> we were running around the track together. There was a pack of kids up in the front, and there was Ben and me in the back. Uh, the coach was yelling at us, gentlemen, you've got to run the mile in under seven minutes. If you don't, you're going to have to do it again. And Ben would yell back at the coach, gee, coach, if I don't do it in under seven minutes the first time, I'm certainly not going to do it in under seven minutes the second time. Being two of the slowest kids at school, they quickly became close friends and bonded over their love for food. One summer, Ben got a job driving a Pied Piper ice cream truck. He made $100 a week and could eat any amount of ice cream for free. He thought it was the best job ever and convinced Jerry to join him, but Jerry quit after one day. He didn't think there was a future in ice cream. When they graduated from high school, they remained close friends but chose different paths. Ben had no intention of attending college and only went because of his parents. He later dropped out of four different colleges, Colgate University, Skidmore College, NYU, and the New School. In between each stint, he worked as a McDonald's cashier, janitor, security guard, building superintendent, taxi driver, delivery man, and an emergency room clerk. Meanwhile, Jerry stuck with studying pre-med at Oberlin College in hopes of becoming a doctor. But his plans changed after applying to medical school. All 20 of his applications were rejected. Not knowing what to do next, Jerry moved into Ben's apartment in New York City. He got a job as a lab technician and took biochemistry class to improve his chances of getting into medical school. Ben got into pottery and drove all over the country in a white Ford van to try and sell his pots. We were the only two of our friends that uh, did not appear to be uh, getting anywhere in the world, so to speak. At the time, neither of them knew failing would be part of their journey to success. Forced to start over. Three years before Ben and Jerry's expanded to grocery stores. One year later, Jerry got rejected from 20 medical schools again. Meanwhile, Ben failed to sell a single pot, so they later decided to try their luck at starting a bagel business together. But they discovered the equipment would cost $40,000. It was more money than they had combined. They figured ice cream had to be cheaper, so they pursued that idea instead. They started by paying $5 for a course on how to make ice cream and picked up brochures on how to start a business. Afterwards, they moved to Saratoga Springs to open their first ice cream shop. It turned out to be a huge disappointment. Before they could even try, someone beat them to it. So they packed their bags and moved to Burlington, a college town in desperate need of an ice cream shop. The only affordable location they found was an old rundown gas station. There were holes in the roof, six inches of ice on the floor, and hardly any walls. Still. Ben and Jerry decided to make an offer. They applied for a $26,000 loan, but only received $4,000. Ben's father made a small investment, but it wasn't enough to cover all of their costs. So they settled on used equipment and did renovations themselves. It forced them not to throw money at problems and become experts in their industry. Drowning in debt. 
six years before Ben and Jerry's raised $750,000. In May 1978, they finally opened their ice cream shop called Ben and Jerry's. With Jerry's biochemistry background and help from a textbook, they perfected the mix using high quality ingredients. There was just one problem. Ben had anosmia, a condition that made it hard for him to smell or taste and test the ice cream. So he suggested that they intensify their flavors and add chunks of fruit or candy. Jerry wasn't sold on the idea but compromised. Fortunately, customers were hooked and considering the chunks part of Ben & Jerry's signature style. Still, Ben & Jerry failed to make a profit. They later realized it was because they were overscooping their ice cream. They couldn't bring themselves to limit their scoops, so they decided to start selling wholesale tubs of ice cream. We started selling to some local restaurants to try to survive, and then uh, after we bought a truck, uh, it was costing us more money to repair this old truck that we bought than we were making selling ice cream. That was a really rough time. Eventually, Ben and Jerry faced bankruptcy and were forced to come up with another idea. They decided to pack their ice cream in pint containers instead of wholesale tubs and sell them to mom and pop grocery stores. From there, they started selling to independent distributors outside their home state. Sales increased by more than 300%. It proved that even a disability in bankruptcy could not stop them from growing. Proving the lawyers wrong three years before Ben & Jerry's became a $30 million empire. After expanding to other states, Ben & Jerry realized they needed to move operations to a bigger facility. But to do that, they would need more money. While venture capitalists offered to invest, they rejected each one in the favor of the Vermont community. They wanted them to be shareholders instead. That way, when the business prospered, they would too. Their lawyer told them that they were crazy and insisted they take the money from the venture capitalists. Instead, they visited Vermont's head of banking and insurance for advice. He told them there was a pretty unknown part of Vermont's law that would allow Ben and Jerry to register as stockbrokers. If they did, they could sell company shares to the Vermont community themselves. Ben and Jerry followed his advice and held Vermont's first in-state public stock offering. Everyone told them it would fail since the community was small and not particularly rich. Still, they traveled around the state telling people how they would use their money. They also advertised their offering the newspaper with the headline, Get a Scoop of the Action. The offering sold out and showed what can happen when you put your community first. The legendary battle with Pillsbury. 16 years before Ben and Jerry's were bought out for $326 million. Ben and Jerry raised $750,000. They had more than enough money to move into a bigger facility. All they had to do next was to sell more ice cream. They came up with the idea of buying an ad but could only afford to run it on late night TV for 10 seconds. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Jerry. You know, we may not have the money to go on TV for 30 seconds, but we sure do make some of the best ice cream you ever tasted. Look for us on top, top of every pint. Their simple idea worked, but created an even bigger problem. The Pillsbury Corporation just bought haagen and feared that Ben & Jerry's would become a threat. So they warned their distributors to stop selling their ice cream. haagen was a steamroller. It was just going, and what was in its path, it took care of. Under the federal antitrust law, Pillsbury's actions were considered a restraint of trade. Being a company that dominated the market, they weren't allowed to use their power to shut competitors out. Ben and Jerry could sue, but it would go nowhere since Pillsbury was worth over $4 billion. So they decided to launch a campaign called, What's the Doughboy Afraid of? You know, the reason why you can't find Ben and Jerry's on the shelf is because this, this big corporation is trying to prevent you, the consumer, from having a choice about what kind of ice cream you want to buy. They placed the sticker on their pint containers that said, what's the doughboy afraid of? Next to it was a 1-800 number connected to a recording of them telling people what Pillsbury was doing. Their idea worked. Pillsbury got hundreds of calls from angry customers and even a letter from an unexpected insider. It was signed Charles Pillsbury. This was 
Pillsbury's kid. <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, I'm very disappointed at the actions of the company against this small Vermont company, and I look forward to discussing it with you, Dad, when I see you for Christmas dinner. Pillsbury backed off and settled out of court. Under the terms, they agreed not to prevent their distributors from selling Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I think Ben & Jerry's is the establishment now, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. You know, they're not the small entrepreneur, we're the small entrepreneur. Ben & Jerry's continued to grow and entered several more markets. To meet the demand, they raised more money through a national public stock offering. They also set up a foundation to allocate 7.5% of pre-tax profits towards driving social change. At the time, most U.S. corporations gave about 1.5%. In the first half of the year, sales reached $3.6 million, double what they earned the year before. Two years later, Ben & Jerry's became a $30 million empire. They went on to launch more iconic flavors, including chocolate chip cookie dough. And in the year 2000, they were acquired by Unilever for $326 million. An independent board of directors was created to ensure that the company remained focused on product quality and social change. In an interview, Jerry shared one of his and Ben's secrets to success. Don't just do something because it's a trendy idea and will make you a lot of money. The reason I say that is because any kind of venture involves going through difficult times. If you're doing something you're passionate about and really believe in, then that will carry you through. This is the story of how two underdogs took on a billion dollar corporation and built America's favorite ice cream brand. For more inspiring stories and advice from today's most successful leaders, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.